Welcome back to another special edition of the Fantasy Golf Bag Podcast. Skyler here, hosting once again, joined by a special guest. We've all fallen in love this time of the year with the Outlaw Tour, and we get to have Bear Heiser on tonight with us, who's been the social media presence at a lot of behind the scenes working with the Outlaw Tour. Has an awesome story that he's going to share with us. So, Bear, thank you so much for grabbing some time on this Saturday evening. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. I'm uh, happy to be talking about it. You've brought uh, a lot of light to a downtime in sports right now, man. And, you know, your interaction with all of us on social media has continued to grow the love for this tour. So tonight, you know, we're really going to dive in to, to learn a little bit more about you and your involvement, the the current state of what's going on in the Outlaw Tour and how the, the future plans with the ever-changing kind of golf world right now. So if we start from the top, you know, it seems like a really unique story you were describing to me a little bit earlier, but walk me through a little bit of your involvement with the outlaw tour and you know kind of the origination of what's been going on yes yeah, so um my my involvement is uh, i run i uh, run the twitter account uh obviously um i also um uh, run the live streaming as well so i you know work with levi and our guys tj and justin and Corey to help them get set up with live streaming and on twitch periscope you know whichever you know platform we decide to use um yeah that's that's pretty much my involvement. I help with uh, planning, uh, also sponsorships and, you know, growth opportunities. Uh, it's kind of come uh, fast. Uh, all of this has happened very quickly. Uh, it's only been about seven weeks, but it feels like an eternity just because so many things have happened and there's just a, all the support that we've gotten has provided an immense amount of opportunity for us to continue growing. And it's like every day there's something new, uh, you know, I'm getting a call from somebody else who's like, Oh man, I just saw what you guys are doing. That's, uh, so it's, it's really just providing, uh, a, you know, the support has been incredible, uh, not only from the fans, but the players as well. It's, it's truly been embraced by such a, such a unique community to your point, the players, everybody, you know, hopping on board the last seven weeks of tournaments, one from, uh, a pure daily fantasy side of things has has brought a lot of entertainment. But two, I mean, the the growth of the golfers. You know, we spent time over the last few weeks on this podcast talking to Noah Hoffman, talking to Ryan French at the Monday Qualifier. You know, we've, we've had some, you know, more light shined on, you know, this type of golf out here. And it's really what you guys are doing. So seven weeks ago, DraftKings pops up with an outlaw tournament. Light bulbs are going off. You know, how kind of this involvement that you're walking into, you know, with these guys, you know, how did that start? Uh, yeah. So it's, I just, I, I can't, I think it was like a Friday, uh, maybe like a Thursday. It was like, I think a Thursday morning. And I was talking to a buddy, um, a good buddy of mine, Jeremy, and we happened to be popping around on the DraftKings app because we talk, you know, we talk sports all the time. And, you know, with, quarantine and no sports we had just kind of run the gamut of like talking everything personal we could so we're like all right well let's see what we what we can gamble on <laughs> and uh and i was like outlaw tour we got i gotta check this out and uh you know i googled it and you know there wasn't a lot of information so um uh, you know i'm a, a a big golf fan uh, i love you know fantasy sports uh especially golf dfs uh so I, you know, I talked to, I told my buddy that I was going to email the tour and I was going to see if they'd be interested in live streaming the events because we needed something to watch. So, uh, I emailed Corey Powell, uh, one of the co-founders of the tour. Uh, we got on the phone, I think within like two hours. Um, and then I talked to Michael O'Leary later that day and then we reconvened the next day. And I think by the end of the weekend we had, you know, we, we had a plan to move forward with live streaming every event from, what would it have been? I think the legacy would have been the the first legacy would have been the the first event through um, all the way through the Reno Open. So, yeah, it's uh, it was kind of just, um, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, a, a really weird opportunity as just, you know, when I think back, it's like so it's almost like stupid to think about it's like, <laughs> kind of like dared dared the universe to tell me I couldn't do it. So uh yeah and it, it worked out so it's pretty cool well first off thank you for sending those emails because you know sweating without live golf you know you know on the tv is tough when we had to live through those you know nine hole updates 
yeah. they were tough times. So to get to get hole by hole scoring, to be able to watch, you know, the live groups, um, you know, one, I know the community has really, really enjoyed that. So thank you for doing that. And two, I mean, it's, you know, I, I had the conversation, like I'll bring it up again with, with Ryan French with the Monday qualifier and it, you know, truly finding your passion and following it is, you know, not something that's easy for everybody out there to do it. So to, to fire a shot in the dark email and to be where you're at seven weeks from now, you know, you can't imagine sometimes the possibilities and I'm sure you're, you're just scratching the surface, you know, on what's to come with this. Yeah, uh, I think so, too. And just to kind of go back, you know, you mentioned the live scoring. Um, you know, we couldn't the players. I don't know if everyone knows this, but the players literally like will go on their phones after every hole and input their own score or one player in the group will do it. So, yeah, as much as like, yeah, you're welcome. You know, it's it's the <laughs> players. The players are the ones who, who actually agreed to do it. So and that, you know, that's it's it's just awesome to you know and, and i think that they've been super engaging to make the live streaming work and to make the product um you know better uh, i'll i'll never forget uh i think it was three weeks ago uh levi one of our streamers was standing on the green talking to dylan Wu like while he was reading his putt and i was like that's not normal you don't see that typically with golf and that that's kind of that's what we you know I, what we hope to bring to the live streaming coverage is the fact that like, you know, like I said, I'm a golf fan and I hate golf coverage. I think it's just, awful. <laughs> you know, if I have to watch like another chief marketing officer sponsor interview that takes 10 minutes and then, you know, it's, it's bookended by commercials and, you know, 30 minutes later, we've seen six shots and <laughs> like, you know, keep it. So, you know, we just wanted to prove the model that you can with, you know, just with a cell phone, you can, uh, you know, fire up a stream and it doesn't have to be the greatest quality in the world as long as the product is is strong and the the fan, you know, the engagement is there. Um, you know, it's it can work. And I think that's it's been, um, you know, we could have tried to you know go really heavy early on. And but I think just kind of going slow and steady just to figure out, you know, we had a lot of hiccups. I mean, I'm sure you, you saw like with Periscope, it wasn't it wasn't the best, the, the best, the phones were overheating, you know, we've guys having like iPhone sixes and like, I'm calling them guys, go upgrade your phones. Like this isn't going to, you know, so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, now with Twitch, it seems like we have a, a nice little rhythm going and, um, you know, we're kind of figuring some things out with Twitch and, you know, perhaps some partnerships with them. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's moving in the right direction in terms of the streaming and, and the quality of it. Yeah, no, I would 100% as a, as a fan would agree completely. You know, it's again, I was happy with with day one getting to see these guys. But, you know, the growth that's came from it, you know, continues to get better and better and can provide a platform, you know, to hopefully many, many tours around the world that can, you know, show it. I saw the Swing Thought tour today, which is a tour that's primarily here in Florida, was, yeah. uh, you know, I think Twitter Live, they were showing theirs, you know, like it's already made made wave links um, across kind of this industry. Um, I think there's twofold directions I kind of want to go, but let's stay. you started that conversation with the players and their sure. involvement. So, for those that, you know, probably have been playing DFS and listen to this podcast, they might understand a little bit, but, you know, maybe this can get a little uh, wider reach in this podcast. Explain a little bit from a player selection or player choice, you know, what competing factors do they have with other different tours? I know Michael O'Leary talked about runs two different tours. Um, you know, when a player, why do they pick the Outlaw Tour? You know, how how does that go into their their scheduling thoughts? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of it has to do with just the relationships that Michael and Corey and uh, Jesse Burkhart, uh, who's a, one of the earlier co-founders, and Tof Peterson had developed over the years just in the golf community in the Scottsdale, Phoenix area. Um, and then, you know, the Golden State Tour is one of the, is the premier, you know, mini tour in, in California. So players just would go up and down the coast and play those events. And, you know, you kind of just kind of wing yourself around down into Arizona. And it, it seemed like it was just a really, um, a really great fit for those two tours to come together. Um, you know, the outlaw tour prides itself. And like, I take no credit for this. I had nothing to do with it. Uh, you know, of really trying to create like a professional environment for the players where, you know, like there's a official check-in table with like, you know, the big tent and announcing mm -hmm. each player who's teeing off where they're from 
uh, you know, we have the big scoreboard with the, you know, the hand, the hand, um, the hand, uh, what do call them? Like, you know, like they have it. They, it yeah, 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 when they carry it around. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, people like that. Um, and the players really like it. Uh, I think from, you know, you know, mini tour golf, you, you said, he, you know, Monday Q info was on here. Um, you know, he's, you know, very big and kind of highlighting the struggle of the mini tour player. And, you know, it came out, uh, when was it in Neil Johnson's interview after, I don't know, I think two tournaments ago that he was leaving to go valet cars, mm -hmm. you know, it's like just gets off the course and he's, you know, changing his clothes and he's going to go valet cars to make 180 bucks. And, you know, he's right back at the course the next morning to tee off the, you know, is he's, you know, like, I think it was like four or five shots back of the lead. Uh, so that's kind of, I mean, that's the life these guys live and they love to play golf and they're just waiting for the, for their opportunity. And, um, you know, you think of the local aspect of mini tour golf, especially with the outlaw tour and the golden state tour, how, you know, you can kind of play a lot of those events, um, you know, and, and drive to a yeah, lot of them. Yeah. Uh, I think it's just economically uh, friendly for them as well. And, you know, to you know the the sentiment that I've gotten from the players and I've I've gotten to know a lot of them over the past couple of weeks is um, you know they just want to feel attached to something. You know I was talking to to Neil the other day and he was telling me how um, he just he loves how close he's his, the, his fans have been able to uh, get to him in his golf game and just like how much support that is and um, you know it's really cool to see that these guys like Matt Picanzo. Um, you know, it was just, you know, he's a guy that's just been crushing mini tour uh, events for like two years. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't pick up a club for, I think, like a couple of years and then just decided to start playing again. And, um, you know, it's guys like that. They're just waiting for their chance to, you know, to uh, to really string it together. And, um, yeah, so it's it's uh, I think that obviously, again, it couldn't work without the players and the support and they're just uh, commitment to want to play. Uh, on our tour. And I, I couldn't agree more with kind of the one, the, the aspect of, you know, retention of the players, you know, that's gotta be something built, you know, from when this tour started, there is competition for these guys to play and, you know, big type of events when you're drawing these, these big names over and over, like that is awesome to see. And yeah. some relationships, like you said, that started three, four years ago and have continued to grow. And, you know, Neil Johnson's fan, he's probably got the biggest fan club on Twitter, you know, Neil hole by hole. We're sorry last week that you didn't get to go on the live stream until like he had like a 58 watch, you yeah. know, I, but, uh, I, I remember I DM'd you and I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh shit, they're going to be mad. Yep, I was, yep. that was a big decision that I had, that I, that we were making that night. I was a little worried that yeah, finally, but jo John Oda doesn't come along that much. You know, you got to get John Oda when you can. No, that, yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, but no, I mean, it's, it's incredible, you know, from, from the aspect of them relating to us too, you know, we've gotten to not only have Noah on the pod, but gotten to know him quite a bit over the last few weeks for those that saw, you know, he did an interview, uh, with some, in some fantasy golf bag gear today, put it up on Twitter. He's rocking the polos this past week, this next week, and, you know, helping him try to get a kickstart on his new pro career. And, you know, like as a fan and someone who wants to see the growth, growth of golfers like that is something that's so cool. You know, I can't imagine the day, you know, years from now, if Noah was to ever make the tour, you know, like that kind of stuff is like unbelievable that you're attached to, you know, from, from that level. So good yeah. on you guys continuing to, to grow that and, and building that side. And I think second fold with all of this is, truthfully probably the the reason it's grown in popularity and why you jumped on the opportunity is because daily fantasy sports has become involved in it you know without DraftKings and FanDuel you know there were betting odds for maybe you know the two three tournaments before but it hadn't got to the echelon of popularity it is now how did DraftKings start with the outlaw tour you know how is that relationship I know FanDuel's on board now how did that all begin uh, well, DraftKings started, I, I think they were running events for two weeks before I had reached out to Michael and Corey. Um, and, th and again, that's how I, you know, came across this to begin with. Uh, since then, though, I mean, I've, I've been, you know, I, I used to work at FanDuel back in the day. And um, so, you know, a lot of the guys who uh, I knew and worked with back then are, are now 
are you know have running all, uh, you know some of the biggest sites right now uh, are guys that I used to work with back when I was uh, in affiliates at FanDuel. So it just kind of worked out that those relationships were still alive for me. And also, um, you know, some of my good buddies from FanDuel had gone over to work at DraftKings. So I, I just, when I got involved in this, I started, you know, making calls to everyone I knew uh, just to see what the long-term support opportunity was and, or is. And um, yeah, it's, they've, uh, you know, I, I have weekly, sometimes twice a week dialogue with them just to kind of get a sense of what they're feeling. They, they love the fact that our schedule, um, you know, falls on Monday, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And if you think of, you know, what there is to, to, um, engage with sports wise on those days, it's really just like European soccer. Uh, and that's, I think just when you, a premier league, it's, you know, that I think those matches on, you know, start around like one or, or mm -hmm. one or two East or central time. Um, so it's not really anything competitive and, and golf is happens to be one of the biggest crossover sports from a wallet share standpoint for, for fantasy sports. So, um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're super engaged. I know that, uh, or they, they talked to Sam triplet. They brought Sam triplet onto one of their Madden live streams, I guess, cool, built cool. between like the Madden Madden games that they simulate. They do a studio show or something like that. And they had, um, Sam, they brought Sam on for an interview last week. Uh, they interviewed Corey. I saw Corey's. Yep. And I think they're going to, uh, I'm trying to set something up for Tuesday or I'm sorry for Monday, but we're, we're just waiting to finalize the tea time for the tournament for uh, Lone Tree. But yeah, they want to, they're trying to integrate the players uh, as much as possible because it really just only helps their ability to, to, uh, you know, to fill contests. And, you know, for them, that's obviously the most important thing. And for us, keeping the prize pools big is, you know, what what's going to continue to to keep that interest. So it's awesome to see, you know, your relationships kind of fostering that and continuing to grow. Because to your point, it is, and I, I said it with Ryan the other day. Like, I mean, it is a opening the schedule where if the money can be rolled over before Thursday lock on PGA, and if they're going to keep doing the showdowns, and I understand why people complain that they want to have the full classic contest, and I get it. So do I, but. I'm not going to complain that there's golf to, to bet on. So, but the showdown contest is a good model to run for one, two days before a Thursday lock to for still sure. get everybody in. And then, you know, you don't have to decrease it because we're probably going to get PGA Millie makers on and off until, you know, NBA, MLB, NFL get back. And if, you know, to that point, I still think they can run things Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and not have a worry because you've seen these contests fill well in advance you yeah. know, most of the time, 50K to first, it's crazy, you know? I haven't seen many. Uh, I don't think I've seen any of the bigger bigger dollar value contests not fill, uh, especially the GPP contests. Um, you know, my hope is, you know, I, I yeah, I love the showdown component. And it, it uh, yes, for every reason you just laid out, the volatility of, of you know, some of the, the rounds that you see scored on a daily basis probably would would you know breed for a better like a three-day contest might be a little bit uh more sustainable you know it, it's just so up and down on a daily basis that um you know there is a slight amount of you know that frustration that you alluded to you know i think that they could get to and i know you guys are big european tour um supporters you know kind of take that route with you know, building out some smaller contests for, you know, for outlaw tour, if it, you know, would be the full, uh, the full tournament, but you know, whatever it's, it's, it's awesome. And the fact that, you know, in the chats and these live streams that are, you know, people are, are talking, you know, DFS, uh, all the time. Um, it's, it's pretty cool to see. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and that's kind of the way I look at it is it's niche in a sense, but it's in the sport that we all are so passionate about that the Euro contest, you know, could be even when PGA is fully running, you could run these others. And again, no competition breeds more money for DraftKings to make and more if, it, if the wallet sharing that, you know, that you're saying, like it, it only makes sense. So um, continuing to grow and if they're, they're supporting, continue to do that. I'm here to, to push content and, you know, build the, the good faith in golf. Cause that's, you know, the, the, the thing with the golfers, you know, that the level of talent that not the level of talent, wrong way to put the level of their status right now, you know, isn't 
PGA tour where these guys are just waiting, you know, to just the, the resumption of the colonial in two weeks, you know, these guys are, are fighting for cards in the Latino America tour, the McKenzie tour, which unfortunately got canceled, you know, yesterday. So how are you guys embracing potentially the opportunity with the scheduling opening for a lot of guys that fall in this yeah. um, status class for, for mini tours right now? And, and how are you guys embracing one, the opportunity that could now exist? Yeah, uh, we are fully embracing it. Um, even before the the McKenzie tour announcement, uh, I think for probably the last like three weeks, we've been um, we've been Michael and Corey most specifically have been trying to put together a really comprehensive look of what our 2020 calendar can look like. And you know, in my opinion, I think flexibility is our biggest asset because we have the ability to schedule events on shorter term notice because you know we're not trying to put up a massive production. You know, you give us tee times, you give us carts, and we can play golf. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, and everything else will just fall into place. So it, it, it's a pretty simplistic process from an operational standpoint. I'm I'm sorry, Michael and Corey, if you're hearing this. Um, I don't really mean that. Uh, I just mean from a scheduling standpoint. Uh, that we, yeah, I mean, we're just trying to align with all the, where the opportunity is and trying to provide the players who are kind of shit out of luck right now with, with things being canceled. And, and it's just awful. Um, you know, I talked to a couple of players today who said that they were, they spent a couple hours last night trying to plan out their entire calendar now because, um, you know, McKenzie tour is just not an option. And now they're trying to look at, you know, outlaw events, golden state events, um, what else? Uh, all pro events in um, in Texas and in Oklahoma, uh, state opens, Texas state open, uh, Colorado state open. Yeah, I mean, there's just right now people are scrambling to figure out what their schedule is going to look like, and and you know we're just really trying to um, to provide you know provide them as many opportunities as possible. I, I'm sure you saw the tweet I put out earlier. Um, you know, we're trying to lock down courses in a couple of different states. So, hey, if anyone out there wants to help us uh, put us in touch with some some uh, awesome golf courses in uh, in some different states. Uh, yeah, we'd love to. Uh, we're trying to grow. Um, you know, I, I think that you know, we're not trying to be the PGA Tour. We're not trying to be the Corn Ferry Tour. Uh, we're trying to you know, we're just going to try and be continue being the outlaw tour. And, you know, run our events at a time when we know our audience is really uh, interested in, in engaging with the product. And, um, yeah, so I, I'm excited about the possibility of being able to align our calendar with 2020, at least with 2020, with a lot of the open dates that have now uh, been opened by, you know, Monday qualifiers not happening or, um, you know, tours not happening. I just, and even going further on the Monday qualifier concept that, there's fewer opportunities. You know, if you don't qualify, you don't make any money. So players, you know, just think of all these players right now who uh, are in Arizona and imagine if there was a Monday qualifier for this first Corn Ferry event. You know, I don't think there is. Um, you know, they're really unlikely to go. If there's fewer opportunities, you know, like there's less incentive for these guys to make the big financial commitment to travel across the country to go qualify. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of what we're thinking. No, I mean, it's, it's again, where there's, um, not panic, but where there's, um, opportunity, you know, in the sense you have to, you have to take advantage no matter what the time and, and space may be at the yeah. world, you know, people are looking to play golf. And if you can provide that, you know, that's where and I know Picasso was one who had, I believe, the McKenzie tour set up for this coming year. Um, you know, the Paul brothers spent a lot of time on the, the McKenzie tour last year. You know, it's it was it, it sucks. It really does suck for them because it, it puts back their career progression, you know, another year because those guys, a good year in the McKenzie tour leads you to the Corn Ferry. A great year on the Corn Ferry, and they're on the PGA Tour within grass. You know, two two excellent years in a row. You have a tour card, and your life could be forever changed. You know, that's the hard part, and I'm sure you know you feel for them in this you know time because they're they're on the cusp, and now you know they're all, everybody in, in any tour below the PGA Tour. You know, is kind of shit out of luck these days. It's it's hard. Yeah, these are. Uh, I have not met one or uh, look, I haven't met any of the guys in person, just to be very candid. 
you know, but I text and talk, talk to them on the phone, you know, here and there, and they're all great guys. Like not one of them is, you know, like they're all really good guys. And that's, you know, that's the hardest part is just to kind of, uh, you know, as I, you know, I'm an old, I'm almost 38. You know, I think of you know, what I would have, you know, you know, back in, you know, when I was younger of, you know, trying to play, you know, super competitive sports. And if that opportunity was ripped away from me due to like some sort of crazy pandemic, like I can't even imagine, you know, what I would have been thinking, um, you know, I would have spiraled. So uh, it's just, you know, these guys, um, you know, it's, it's really great to see that they are, um, you know, they're just pushing forward and they still want to play and, uh, you know, they're, you know, not going to let this stop them, uh, I suppose. And I mean, to your point, you know, the reaction of somebody who, you know, like ourselves, if it would have been ripped away from us, you know, in our, our playing days, but it's also these guys financial livelihood too, you know, like you said that, you know, pick it up and going on the road playing Monday qualifiers. One, if you're not good enough to to qualify or you don't run good in, you know, a certain one, you know, you're out of money quick. Yeah. You know, that's it's not an easy game for those that that don't make it through. So from a money perspective, you know, it, it does. The the prize pools are hard to match that are PGA Tour affiliated events, but these guys that do well, you know, they can still make a living doing this and and it's probably tough for people to wrap and myself. I wasn't as aware, you know, about all of these mini tours until I've done the diving into understanding it. But these have existed, you know, for years and years. And these golfers have, you know, someone like Nick Mason has been playing on these tours for decades. You know, like it's, it's been around there, you know, it, it existed before DraftKings. It will exist if daily fantasy didn't, you know, happen for it, you know, beyond this, but you know, you just really hope for, for these golfers and for our, our fanhood of them, you know, they're able to make this out stronger and we, you know, become, you know, being able to play them when, when the time's right. Like that's, that's the hard part to wrap your head around all of it, but we embrace the time now and, and really look forward to a, another event next week on the calendar. So from, from my understanding, you're flying out, right? You're heading out to Phoenix for the first time to be there live for an event. Yeah. I'm um, going to go out there uh, tomorrow with the uh the family and yeah i'm i'm pretty pumped i'm gonna play uh so sunday morning I'm gonna play um with um or sunday afternoon with uh levi one of our streamers tj who's another streamer who is, happens to be in the field and then uh and then uh my guy barry enright who's just been become one of my favorites that guy's awesome uh yeah so we're gonna we're gonna mess around tomorrow and uh yeah monday is uh the start of lone tree and yeah man i'm i'm really excited to be to like be ac actually be there i'm gonna be sweating my balls off but uh <laughs> that's probably inappropriate to say but uh yeah i mean I'm, I'm really excited to be able to see it in person of like what this actually is you know i, I see it from sitting you know uh uh, sweating in my garage in in Austin, um, you know, s sitting watching the streams and everything, and trying to make sure everything's going up, going smoothly. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty pumped about uh, being able to check it out in person. Well, being able to play with an outlaw tour winner slash professional professional baseball player is you know a one of a kind type of thing because he's probably the only one that exists. You know, an outlaw winner pro baseball player like that Barry's win the other week was incredible you know we've actually seen a string of some some awesome wins you start with a long shot at the Scottsdale Open Zach Smith won you know 750 to one he was as odds, odds Barry Enright was 500 to one and then we see him this week and he's like 22 to one you know he's one of the top five players or top 10 players priced in the field so you know, Barry, you mentioned before you've been obsessed with just the fantasy sports industry. Yeah. You, you played DFS before. I, I say we grab the next five, 10 minutes. We take a look at this field, kind of see your thoughts. You might have some inside scoop on what we have here, but prices haven't uh, for, for full transparency, 1030 Eastern time, Saturday night. Haven't seen DraftKings prices, so I don't know if Bear can affect those up a few up a few hundred or down. But let's see. Is there anybody that stands out to you this week, or you've gotten close with and enjoy their game? Yeah, um, you know, I think it's only. I mean, your guy Noah. I mean, I I, I love that kid. I think he's awesome. Uh, we had you know a little bit of a 
a hilarious start to, to our relationship. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited to see what he's able to do. Um, you know, I've been pretty much, I've been watching as much as, as I can when, when he's, I think twice has been on the streams and uh, one of his buddies has been sending me some of the, some of the uh, videos to put up and, and that's really cool. Um, yeah. I'm, we have Sahith, Tagala, yes. I think is his name. He had played at Pepperdine. He was, uh, he's, this is, he's just now, I think this is his first pro event. Um, yeah, we're all like really excited to, to see what he is, is able to do out there. I want to spend time on, on Tigala. Yeah. He's, um, for those that don't know, I'm, I'm super excited for him to be in the field. He did play the charity event in, in Texas recently at Merido. Um, got to play a little bit, but yeah, for those that don't know, he's a number three, uh, amateur in the world right now. The number one in the States played out at, you said at bear, uh, Pepperdine, just an absolute stud. So that's awesome. He's turning pro and, and getting this chance out here. He opened like cross seas, like as the, the favorite, I thought maybe, Hey, do we get a sleeper here a little bit? And then I see him like six to one and I'm like, okay, he's the top of the field. We're going to see him 10 K plus. Um, so no, that's really cool that, that the gal is playing this week. Um, let's see. Well, spoiler alert. There's someone else in the field who we just talked about who went to Pepperdine. So we're going to get a little, uh, featured, featured group action with, uh, with Tagala and, uh, in Barry Enright. And, uh, I don't know who we're, I don't, I'm not sure who is, uh, uh, I haven't seen the rest of the tea times, but they're, they're, they're being worked on as we speak. I love that. I love that with Barry. Um, and then we obviously we have Neil coming back. Neil, what did he end up shooting last week? I think he had like a 64 or 65. He was on like 59 watts, like we said earlier. Yeah. So in yeah, in the second round, Neil, uh, yeah, he was on he was on what 59 watch, and we uh, well, I think it was uh, he was going to shoot the course record. So I, he, I think it was like 60, 62 was the course record, and he was eight under through 16 if i'm remembering correctly he wasn't being streamed uh i popped on twitch and i told levi to go over to his group and uh then he ended up like par bogey par yeah yeah levi levi ruined the the bogey free round course record yeah. classic uh, he did uh, yeah it's it's squarely his fault and he will love the fact that i just said that so <laughs> um yeah, and I, I no or uh, Neil closed out strong too. I think he shot like four or five under in the last round. So it's uh, yeah, he's he's stringing together a bunch of really solid rounds. I think he opened with a he was like even or plus one in the first round, but yeah, he finished with two two strong rounds. It's one thing that I'm realizing, you know, you said it earlier on the the volatility in a single round, you know, of Outlaw Tour. It's it's I mean, even on the PGA Tour, you know, you see spectrums of highs and lows and the next day it's like the previous day didn't happen, you know, and that's where, you know, I try to pride or at least preach myself what I think day one should stay the same day two and day three. Of course, people are going to get hot and stay hot, but Neil's the exact point. He was probably the second or third highest owned guy day one. Day two, he's like low teens and he shoots the round of the day and then he's back in the 30s the next day. So if you were confident and high on Neil Johnson day one, you know, whoever it may be, stay on them and the ownership may dictate based off the day before, but don't don't change your thoughts on it. Um, uh, let's see who else stuck out to me. Austin Batista. Um, he had, he came out, I think he was like six under through seven. Uh, the last round or the last, yeah, the last round last week. Um, he had a back-to-back really good rounds for an 11th place finish last week. He stood out to me. Um, I did see a late field ad. Hopefully DraftKings prices him in. He doesn't have betting odds, but Trevor Lampson's back. Um yeah. He got his heart broke by Matt Picasso in that playoff. Um, is he still an amateur? Do you know? He's listed as an amateur on there, He's right? An am. Yeah, there's, I think this for, the field's 48, 47 pros, and, and him is the lone amateur. Okay. Uh, yeah, so he's he's back. Um, yeah, one of my – one of our – the guys who we have stream, um, Justin, pointed him out before that tournament, and uh, he's like, watch this kid. He's going he's gonna to go low. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was cool to say, I was like, well, shit, man, you were right. Uh, this kid went low and he, he hung in there until the very end. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's every week it's like, it's, it's a different name. It's someone, you know, coming through and it's just a matter of, you know, something clicking with these guys to, to really be able to put it together over the longer, you know, a longer period of time to, to, to make that leap. 
Yep, I, I couldn't agree more. And I spent a lot of time, and we had him on the the we did the Twitch stream before the Scottsdale Open. We had uh, Notorious from Roto Grinders on our yep. podcast, and we're talking all the time, trying to find who that next Trevor Lampson, Zach Smith, Barry Enright is, because for a while it felt like the only people that win were like. KK and Galetti and all the top of the board guys. And then now all of a sudden we've seen this stretch of out of nowhere, people are winning and showing how good this, you know, this, this razor thin line of, of a talent is between the top of 20 to one or 500 to one. And like, yeah. it's, it's crazy. I mean, we, I, we see someone who I'll probably be high on again, Brandon Bauman, who yeah. had, um, he showed out, I believe he's Zach Smith's college uh, teammate mm. out of uh, UC Santa Barbara stud there but i mean these names we we see a few new ones this week but um you know it's some of those same cores that are just strong strong guys that have shown some really good performances here i'll, I'll throw some names at you so brady calkins is back in the field this week so he, I think he was t4 in scottsdale uh he had to withdraw last week uh, but he's back in the field so that's going to be really and cool. from and, understanding it wasn't an injury related right people sometimes get worried on that it was not no it was okay not, yeah. Um, uh, who else is, uh, so like I mentioned before, my guy, TJ Katherinberg, who's, uh, he is, this is going to be his first pro event. Uh, he's, uh, he's always played as an amateur before, uh, and this is his home course. So Ooh. he, uh, yeah, he's really excited to be playing, uh, in this event and, uh, he's a young kid. Um, I think he, uh, he went out, where were we at last week at Southern Dunes? He went out and shot like a 69 at Southern Dunes. Nice. I um, you know, just last minute went out and fired. Yeah. I was like, all right, man, like, do you practice at all? Nope. All right. Well, no. Incredible. So I, Gino San, uh, is someone who's, who's been thrown at me. And then, uh, Corey Powell's favorite Tyler Waworski, uh, T-Dub as he likes to call him is back, is back this week. So, well, uh, worst keys round two, I think it was, was one of the more wild things that I've seen. I think I tweeted it at Shane Bacon, the psycho yeah. card where he was one under on the front, but had one par. It was incredible. Yeah, it's uh, well, I mean, that's that's a lot of these cards that you see. Uh, so that's the volatility. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, it's 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 uh, <laughs> it's it's great. to It's it's interesting golf to watch. It's it's fun to watch because, you know, these guys are just constantly like, I don't know that they're they're you know pin seeking, but these guys are just making a lot of they make a lot of birdies. I mean, you look at Corn Ferry and, and those events and the players. The reason some of these younger corn or players that graduate from Corn Ferry do well in the PGA right away is because they're they know how to go out and, and shoot 62, 63, um, and to put up you know super low scores. And I think that you know, you see that in in fields like this where these guys are able to go out and just put up really low numbers because they just are able to score, score, score. I mean, the number of eagles that we had last week, I, I don't know. I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's you know a ton of eagles uh, over the course of the three-day tournament. Um, you have to. I mean, and not only Corn Ferry, the Monday qualifiers, like everything. If you're not if you're not putting up a 64, you know, you, you pack your bags. It's yeah. it's crazy. Have you heard anything about the course this week? I used to live in Phoenix. I'm, I, I've heard a little bit, but you're getting to play it tomorrow. Oh, yeah. So we need to get we need to get an overview from you. Yeah. So it is uh, it's wide open. OK. Uh, I think there's water on like five holes, five holes. I was, I was talking about it with someone today. Uh, it's a shorter course. Uh, I, I, my buddy told me he's like, you won't hit more than three drivers out there. Uh, well, unless you're, you know, unless you want to, uh, he said, you probably.